So this is my disclosure. So what I'm going to try to spend a few minutes to discuss is whether could LAA occlusion be an alternative to anticoagulation in patients with AFib who needs triple therapy after PCI. So I got two questions for you. The first one is, in your practice or uh, hospital, are PCI patients already treated with LAA occlusion device? There's four options, no, only very few, some patients, but it's rapidly growing, or D, it's, uh, it's, it's on its way to become a standard of care. So please vote. So it's very few patients today who's offered that. So the background for the discussion is that about well, somewhere between 5 and 7% of the patient who undergoes PCI are already on anticoagulation therapy, uh, often due to AFib, but it can be other reasons, prosthetic heart valves, thrombus in LV, DVT, or pulmonary embolus. And the ESC guideline for revascularization stratify AFib patients uh, after these four condition, is it a stable angina or acute coronary syndrome? Are they going to use a bare metal stent or a drug eluting stent? What is the chat vask score and what is the Hasblad score? So this is the algorithm they're coming out with. And you can see that's for two scenario indications for six months of triple therapy. That's patients who have a low Hasblad score and have an acute coronary syndrome. So there's one group here and one group here. But there's a lot of, lot of other uh, scenario where you should consider to commit these patients on triple therapy. So to summarize it, it's recommended six months of triple therapy for patients with non-valvular AFib, acute coronary syndrome, and has a Hasblad score zero to two, but it should also be considered in patients with even higher Hasblad score. So the dilemma is that um, if you stop uh, the anticoagulation therapy, the patient is at risk of thromboembolic complication due to the AFib. If you stop or you only use monotherapy uh, for the antiplatelets, the patient is at risk for uh, stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction. And of course, triple therapy is associated with major bleeding, which is by itself increased the risk of mortality. So what is the risk of mortality, uh, of a bleeding if you're on triple, triple therapy? This is a very large Danish uh, registrar st study. So they looked into more than 40,000 patients older than eight, uh, 30 years. They were admitted to the hospital sort of the, with a first time myocardial infarction. They had a prescription, and in Denmark you can actually track back whether this prescription was ever uh, claimed at the pharmacy. So they divided the patient up to, in three groups, patient on monotherapy, dual therapy, or triple therapy. And they followed the patients for 15 months at mean, and they looked at the risk for a new hospitalization due to bleeding or recurrent myocardial infarction. And for patient on monotherapy on aspirin, uh, for the, the first year it was 2.6%. And you can see clearly patient on triple therapy, but also patient on the combination of clopidogrel and warfarin had a much higher bleeding instance that required hospitalization than patient on dual antiplatelet therapy. They looked twice to stratify the risk and men had a bit higher risk and of course elderly patients also had a higher risk to reach the endpoint and patients who had a previously bleeding. There's also one prospective study looking uh, into what happening uh, if you on triple therapy. This is a randomized trial from the Netherlands. So they took patient who has been on anticoagulation therapy for at least one year, and they had a coronary lesion that need to be addressed. They randomized patient one-to-one -one between anticoagulation therapy plus, plus clopidogrel or triple therapy. So the regime was followed for a minimum one month on patient with bare metal stent, and for one year with, for patient with drug eluting stent. And the primary endpoint was occurrence of all bleeding uh, using the TIMI criteria. And you can see here the patient who was in triple therapy, as we saw in the Danish registry study, was much higher than patient on dual therapy. And you can see the curve severed very early on. So it's from the day the patient is committed on it, he's running a higher risk of bleeding. 
And this is also shown uh, again in Denmark in a registry study, 11,000 patients, mean age 75 years, most of the patient was male. And you can see here when did it occur, occur the bleeding. And for all treatment regime, particularly for the triple therapy, it's early on the patient at risk for bleeding. And for the ESC guideline, triple therapy was, should be continued for six months, so you're up here. So most of the bleeding incidents will have occurred, occurred within uh, six months. So what if you have this patient with AFib who should go on triple therapy? Could you try to stop the anticoagulation and just continue on dual antiplatelet therapy? And you probably all know the active trial patient with AFib randomized to a combination of clopidogrel and aspirin against anticoagulation therapy. And you can see for both the efficacy and the safety, triple uh, uh, anticoagulation therapy was superior uh, to dual antiplatelet therapy. So stopping anticoagulation in these patients after PCI is not an option. So in summary, you can say triple therapy is recommended for six months after PCI for acute coronary syndrome patients with AFib and a low has blood score. Triple therapy is associated with a with a significant increase in bleeding and mortality. And interruption of anticoagulation therapy puts a patient at risk for a thromboembolic episode. So now the question is, could we change the strategy? And this is a very provocative pro proposal. In high-risk high patients with AFib who fulfill the guidelines for triple therapy after PCI, should you stop warfarin at the time of PCI, continue on dual antiplatelet therapy, and refer the patient for the acute or subacute LAA occlusion. And it's actually partly mentioned in the ESC guideline, patients who have a contraindication for, for triple therapy could be considered to have an LAA occlusion as a class 2B indication. And if it should be done, should the PCI doctor become part of the implanted team? Should he done it during the admission? And should he be done it by himself or herself? Or should he be a part of the structural heart team? So, my last slide and my last question to you. As an implant or implanting team, are you working with the PCI treating physicians to refer more patients? A, no, more evidence is required. Or B, the guidelines are a great start. No, not yet, but I can start using the guidelines. Or D, not interested. So it seems that, uh, that, from what you are voting, that there could be a potential option to, to go this way with these patients. Okay, thank you very much, Lars.